Praise the Lord, President. I'm Pastor Michael Jakes, and welcome to the Wednesday night. Cutting it right Bible study here with another Bible study for your soul and for your heart. We pray that all is well with you and the Lord tonight. Uh, we are streaming right now live on Spreaker.com. That is our podcast platform heard around the world and across the United States. Uh, it is. Uh, we are now streaming live on YouTube. We are streaming live on Facebook and also Periscope slash Twitter. So if you are... If you are watching on Periscope, you can retweet this. If you are watching on Facebook, you can share this page with someone so that someone else also may be blessed. You can also hear all of our podcasts on Spotify, Google Podcasts, iTunes, iHeartRadio. And we praise the Lord for what he is doing in our midst. Amen. We just bless the name of the Lord. Uh, we've just come from a uh, service and, and we're just uh, sort of bubbling over right now. But we just bless the Lord uh, for what he is doing for what he's doing in our hearts and in our lives. You can also find all of our information on our website. That is that's the word.org. That's that's the word.org. And you can also go to our YouTube channel and you can subscribe there if you so desire. Uh, you can just go to that's the word ministries or just type in Pastor Michael Jakes and that will bring you right directly to our YouTube channel. Uh, we are having a Bible study tonight uh, right here on spiritual warfare. The Warrior Sword on tomorrow night. Uh, if you want to also hear a a great, be a part of a great Bible study where you will hear solid uh, and and practical uh, principles uh, for life, uh, please uh, tune in to uh, Clarence Haynes' uh, Bible study from the Bible Study Club. Uh, you will be blessed. You will be blessed uh, as he shares insight uh, from the Word of God. That's tomorrow night on Facebook. That's also tomorrow night on Zoom, and that will be at 8 o'clock p.m. Also, just want to remind you that following this particular study, this series of studies that we are on right now in spiritual warfare, our next study we will be talking about false teachers, false teachers, the danger of false teachers, and we'll be coming out of Second Peter, we'll be coming out of the book of Jude, and also we'll be coming out of the book of Second uh, Timothy, talking about false teachers. False teaching is prevalent, and yes, we will speak about some false teachings, and we will have to also mention some names. And as we mention names, uh, we are not trying to uh, cast a shadow or a doubt on their salvation. We just want to focus in on certain particular teachings when we get there. But we'll be talking about false teaching and how it is sort of overtaking uh, the church. Amen? Amen. We're going to get right into our study for tonight. We're going to pray, and we're going to go right into our study. Lord, we bless your name, and we thank you, Lord, once again. You have allowed us to be in your presence. Lord, we pray for the next few minutes, Lord, that your power and your presence might be with us as we open up your word. Lord, we pray that you will give us insight, Lord, that you will empower us, Lord, to speak your word. Lord, I pray you will give an anointing that cannot be refuted. Lord, I pray that you will just have your way. Speak as only you can speak. Allow your word to transform. Allow your word to educate. Allow your word to empower and enlighten. Lord, do what only only your word can do. Lord, your word declares that it shall not return void, but it shall it shall accomplish the purpose wherewith it was sent. So, Lord, we allow your word to have its way in our hearts and in our lives tonight. Bless those who are listening. Bless those who are watching. Lord, draw those who need to hear this word tonight. Draw them to this place on the World Wide Web. Have your way right now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We give glory to God. We've been coming out of the book of Ephesians the last several weeks. Ephesians chapter number six, that great Ephesians chapter number six, and we've been talking about the armor of God. We've been talking about, thus far, uh, we've been talking about the warrior's belt, that's the word of belt of truth. We've been talking about the warrior's blessed breastplate, that's the breastplate of righteousness. We've been talking about the warrior's shoes, which is the gospel of peace. Uh, we've been talking about uh, the warrior's shield, which is the shield of faith. And we've been talking about, last week we talked about the warrior's helmet, which is salvation. Tonight, tonight, uh, we talk about, tonight we're going to talk about the warrior's sword. The warrior's sword. It's very important that we carry the sword, and the sword, what is the sword? Well, in Ephesians chapter number 17, 17b, he makes it, he makes us very aware what the sword is. Let's read that whole verse. Uh, Ephesians chapter number 6, verse 17. It says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, why do we call, why does he call the word of God 
the sword. Why is it that the word of God is pictured here as a sword? Because what he is saying is that the word of God is a weapon. You see, up until now, all of the pieces of the armor that we've spoken about are defensive weapons. They are defensive. Defensive. We are wearing these things to cover ourselves. We are wearing these things to protect ourselves from the onslaught of the enemy. Uh, the Bible talks about the shield of faith, which we will be able to stand against the fiery darts of the wicked one, who is Satan. And so the word of God, the sword of the spirit, is the only, it is the only weapon that we have that puts us on the offensive. Yes, now we are on the offensive. When we pick up the sword, when we pick up the sword, we are ready to fight. Oh yes, when we pick up the sword of the spirit, we are ready to fight. Up until now, we've just been standing and dealing with whatever the enemy has to throw at us. We've been dealing with whatever the enemy wants to throw at us, the fiery darts and all. But now, when we have the sword, we are in effect ready for battle. We are ready for battle. But remember what we've said. When we talk about putting on the full armor, that's what it says. Put on the full armor. You see, we can't go into battle with all of our battle gear. We can't go into battle with our belt. We can't go into battle with the breastplate and the shoes and the shield and the helmet and leave the sword behind. That's not going to work. You are incomplete. You are an incomplete warrior if you do so. If you leave out any one of these pieces of armor, you are incomplete. But for sure, for sure, if you don't have a sword, you have nothing to fight with. Nothing. What do you Take off your helmet and fight with your helmet. Now, we're talking spiritually now. So you need the sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, let me give you some practical applications of the sword. Practical applications. Number one, while the sword could be used for defense. Oh, yes, the, you could. You've seen sword fights. If you've seen movies and you've seen sword fights on TV, yes, you can use the sword for defense, no doubt about it, to defeat uh, your enemy. But it was designed, the sword was designed for attacking the enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's what the sword was meant to do. So let's spiritualize it right now. If you are going to contend with, and you will, if you are going to battle Satan and his army, you need the sword. You need the sword of the spirit because there will be hand-to-hand -hand combat. He will come against you. When you make up your mind to serve God, when you make up your mind to stand for the Lord, you will need the sword to stand against the enemy. You will need the sword of the spirit. Second point, the soldier would skillfully use the sword to defeat the enemy and protect others. You see, it's not just for your protection. You have others around you that you can also help to protect. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Now, we're going to talk about the Word of God tonight. We're going to talk about the importance and the necessity, oh my goodness, the necessity of the Word of God. And we said we're going to be talking about false teachings uh, in just a few weeks and false teachers. But it is so imperative, so imperative that you, that you know the Word of God for yourself. You need to know the Word of God for yourself. Now, when we talk about the Word of God, there are two words in the Bible that describe the word. Two words in the Bible. In the Greek, there's one word, and that's it's called the logos. It's a word that you've probably heard before. And this is the most common uh, Greek word which we find in the New Testament for the word, word. Logos. The entire, the entire Bible, the entire Bible is... The Logos. This is the Logos right here. Then you have a second word. You have the second word in the Bible 
that also speaks of the word. And it's called Rhema. That's R-H-E-M-A. Rhema. A Rhema word. And this word is also translated word in, in our English language. So, in other words, when you read the Bible, when you read the Bible, it is good. When you begin to investigate, when you begin to dig, when you really begin to study, when you see the word word in the Bible, sometimes it will be talking about logos, and sometimes it will be talking about rhema. So it, it will be up to you once you start studying the Bible to find out which one is being used in that particular place. Now, when we talk about this word rhema, it's used also less. It's used less in the New Testament. This is the word that's used here in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17. So when we read, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, he says the sword of the spirit is the rhema of God. When we talk about the word rhema, we are talking about something specific. We are talking about various scriptures or sayings that we see in the Bible. I say sayings because the Bible originally did not have verses. The original Bible had no verse markings. That was done much, much, much later. So a particular verse or a series of verses or a portion of scripture is a rhema. And more particularly, more technically, it's a word that speaks directly to you. It's a word that speaks directly to your heart. That's a rhema. Now, while the Bible in its entirety is the sword of the Spirit, once again, there are many sayings of God, many things that the Lord has said on various subjects in the Bible, which give, number one, they give wisdom, they give direction, they give answers, they give understanding, they give rebuke, but each way that the word speaks to us, speak to our hearts in a very personal and specific way. And once again, that's a rhema word. So, in a sense, in a very real sense, the Bible is, the Bible is not just a sword. Hear this now. The Bible is not just a sword. But the Bible is actually a series of swords because the Bible is made up of many different words, many different sayings, many different uh, pieces of, of literature that from different subjects. And the Bible is an arsenal of swords which are available for any situation. What comes to mind is Satan attacking Jesus in the wilderness. And what did Jesus do? Jesus used the sword of the spirit, but he used a different rhema word each time that he confronted Satan. That's the word. And that's what the word does. Here's what the Bible says about itself in Book, the book of Hebrews chapter 4, the book of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12 says, For the word of God, the word of God is, number one, it is quick. That word quick in the King James Version doesn't mean what you think it means. It means that it is alive. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. A two-edged sword is a sword that has a blade on both sides. It has a blade on both sides. It will cut. But he says here that the word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing, piercing, even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. So once again, we see the dichotomy. We see the difference between the soul and the spirit, even though some say there's no difference. He makes a difference here. This word of God makes a difference between soul and spirit. And he says, and the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of, of the heart. 
That's the word. That's the word. That's why we need to get this word in our hearts. Get this word in our lives. If you're going to deal with the enemy on any level, you need the sword of the spirit. You need the sword of the spirit. Listen, this word, this word that we speak of, this word, it is alive. It is alive. And I mean that literally. I mean that I don't mean it figuratively. I mean it spiritually, but I mean it literally. The word of God is alive. It is alive. And no other book can claim this. No other book can say that it is alive. No other book can say it has a life. This word has a life. It breathes. It pulsates. It moves. It affects our hearts and our lives. You can open up this word at any time and read something that you thought you knew. You can open up this word at any time and, and read something that you know that you know that you know already. And open that book and read that scripture verse and that scripture verse will literally jump out at you and give new understanding and new revelation to your life. That's what the word of God does because it is alive. Because it is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to us through his word. He is not, he is not dead. He is alive. And so therefore, his word is also alive. This is the living word of God. And that's why you need it. You need it in your life. You do yourself, you do yourself a great disservice. You do yourself a great disservice by not having the right frame of mind when it comes to the word of God. You can say that you're lazy. You can say, I just don't feel like reading. You can just say, you don't like to read. All of those reasons, you have to push them to the side. And you need to get this word in your life. And so we said the word of God is quick. It is alive. The second thing he says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12, he says that the word of God is powerful. It is powerful. And we're going to talk about how powerful it is in just a bit. But this word is powerful. Remember, the word was with God and the word was God. The word has the power of God. The word has the power of God. Let me bring you once again to this scripture that keeps coming up. And I love it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 17. Let's start in verse number 17, and we'll talk about what we mean. We'll talk about what we mean by power. Here's the Apostle Paul speaking in, in 1 Corinthians 1 and 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Notice what it says here, the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So once again, he is equating the cross of Jesus Christ with being the gospel. He goes on in verse number 18 for the preaching or that word preaching is actually the word. The word of the cross is to them who perish foolishness. In other words, those who don't know the Lord don't understand the word. They have no understanding of what the word means. He said it's foolishness to them, but to us which are saved, it is the power of God. What is the power of God? The word of the cross. What is the word of the cross? The gospel. The gospel is the word of the cross. And it is powerful. And that's what Paul also means in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. The word of God is powerful. It is the power of God. He goes on in, in Hebrews 4 and verse number 12. He says that the word of God is not only quick and alive, it is not only powerful, he says, but it is sharp. It's sharp. A metal sword, a metal sword, a sword that's made out of metal can cut flesh. But the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, can cut into your spirit. 
You see, there's a difference there. With one side, the Lord attacks and kills all of our spiritual enemies. We're talking about sharper than any two-edged sword. So with one side, the Lord attacks and, and kills our spiritual enemies. With the other side of the sword, the Lord cuts us like a skilled surgeon. He gets into our life. The Lord uses the same sword to cut things out of the lives of his people. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, you and I need to be purged. We need to be purged. We need for the Lord to cut out certain areas of our life. We need for the Lord to come in with the sword of the Spirit and technically and intricately cut out, cut out those things in our life that have no value, those things in our life that will bring us down. The Bible says, lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. But sometimes we need to be purged of these things and the Lord has to do surgery on us. Spiritual surgery. He has to make incisions in our hearts, in our lives to take out those things that don't belong. Are you a willing patient? Am I a willing patient? Am I willing to allow the Lord to cut away? Am I, am, I, am I willing to allow the Lord to cut out those things in my life that don't belong? We need to be willing patients in the Lord's hospital of grace and allow him to do what only the Holy Spirit can do through the word of God. He goes on to say in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12 that the word of God divides. It's quick, it's powerful, it's sharp, and it divides. What does the word do? The word divides light from darkness. Uh, the, word, the word divides truth from error. That's what the word does. And nothing can fool, nothing can fool or hide from the sword. Nothing. Not a thing. Because once again, because of the nature of the sword, because of what it is, because of what it does, it cuts through all of the things that don't belong. And it gets right to the point. It gets right to the truth. Finally, in 412 of Hebrews, he says the word of God is discerning. Discerning. Nothing is hidden. The enemy can never, should be able to never have a secret agenda outside of the understanding of the child of God. Why? Because the more word, the more word you have in you, the more you are able to discern the enemy's lies. The more word that you expose yourself to. You see, you cannot expose yourself to false teaching and hope that false teaching is going to be the thing that brings you into victory. Because false teaching error has no power to cleanse. False teaching error, does, it has no power to bring victory. It cannot. It is, quote, another gospel. And so we must be willing to align ourselves with God's truth. We must be willing to align ourselves with God's truth. Now, the word of God speaks of itself. The word of God speaks with its, uh, of itself. We're talking about tonight, we're talking about, we're having a study here tonight on the warrior's sword. We want to make sure that we understand that the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, that we want to make sure that we implement it, that we include it in our arsenal of weaponry against the devil. Once again, as we said at the outset, you cannot just stand with the armor, with the breastplate, with the helmet, with the shoes, and with the, with the shield of faith, and just stand there and expect that you're going to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. When he begins to throw his dart, you will not be able to have victory. No, no, no. 
But I have the but I have the sort of sort of faith. If you have your faith, once again, if you have your faith in the wrong place, if you're putting your faith in something other than one particular truth of this word of God, which is that Jesus Christ and him which is Jesus Christ and him crucified, if you have faith in something other than that, then the enemy will make mince meat out of you. Spiritually speaking, there will be nothing you can do if you put your faith in something else. Don't put your faith in the anointing oil. Don't put your faith in how many days you fast. Don't put your faith in a prayer shawl. Don't put your faith in those things. Put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said that he was all about preaching Christ and him crucified. Now, the Word of God, once again, the Word of God describes itself. It is a faithful word. In Titus 1.9, it says, Holding fast the faithful word, as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. This is a, this is a faithful word, ladies and gentlemen. A faithful word. In Ephesians, in Hebrews, rather, chapter 6, and verse number 5, it says, And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Have you known this to be a good word? Is this a good word to you? This is the word of God and it shall stand. The Bible speaks about in James chapter 1 and verse number 21. It says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of, the, of naughtiness and receive with meekness, the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. That engrafted word, it's here. Finally, we see in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 19, we see that we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. This is a sure word. It is a word that you can count on. It is a word that is guaranteed to do what it says. Because the giver, the creator, the maker of this word is not a liar. When he speaks, he speaks truth. And here it is. It is truth. And so we want to we want to make sure we want to make sure uh, that we make this sure word of prophecy and we put it in our lives. We know that this is the word of truth. That is its nature. In Psalm chapter 119 and verse number 43, that great uh, psalm of the word of God. And take not the word of truth. David, David asked the Lord. He says, take not the word of truth out utterly out of my mouth. For I have hoped in thy judgments. The word of truth. He says, don't take your word away from me. We need to make sure 